thanks everyone for um, uh, joining today. Um, hopefully you're on the, um, the, the right webinar and we, um, we really appreciate you joining. Um, today we're going to talk about a, a complete prescription and the five priority areas for employee health and, um, and, and well-being. Um, we, um, we carry out a piece of research, if we, um, if we can just put up the, the, the market map, please. Um, and we have heard very much that um, everyone is overwhelmed by the, by the, the, the choice and the, um, and the noise in the, um, in, the, in the marketplace at the moment. Um, and we're, um, today, we're, we're going to try and help make a little bit of sense of that. Um, we've got um, experts and leaders from some of the companies that you can see on this market map. Um, across um, physical and mental happiness, um, telehealth, prevention, life stages support and non-acute health conditions. Um, what we've done here in this market map is pull together the companies that we think are really making a difference um, in companies at the moment. Those that are focused on outcomes and um, are very, are very evidence-based. Okay, well look, let's crack on with the, the, the question topics. Um, like I said, please, um, Please add your, um, your any any Q and A you, that you'd like us to cover at the end. So the first question, I'm going to go to um, Andy and then Ali. Um, so what what aspects of health and wellness are you seeing front of mind for employers at the moment? And within that, have you seen COVID change how employers are thinking about health and wellness support for their employees? So I'll go to um, I'll go to Andy. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Yes, uh, COVID-19 certainly brought this into a sharper focus. And I, I would think everybody's seen the same kind of information that, um, you know, it's it's mental health and it's MSK related issues due to sort of working from home, you know, that are, that are bubbling up. But the observation I'd have sort of more generally is that that was always the case, really. For a number of years now, those have been the two sort of significant well-being issues that, that um, organisations are aware of. Um, so whilst the focus is being sharpened, I, what I'm optimistic about is I, I think this is now embedding a positive understanding of the need to support well-being into a longer term cultural focus because people's needs change over time. Um, and often employers will have a long term relationship with employees and, and we are getting the sense that um, organizations are really seeing the, the, the true value of, of having that long-term attitude towards supporting their workforce. Great, okay. And uh, Ali, same question to you. What are, what are you seeing front of mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, similarly to Andy, I think uh, COVID has definitely accelerated things, but I don't necessarily think it's revolutionized uh, the way people have thought about this and have been thinking about it recently. I think we've been on an upward trajectory in terms of how businesses have kind of considered well-being, um, especially for their staff. I think uh, what we found, especially through COVID, is that it reminds companies how important getting this right actually is um, and engagement being the sort of the, the most important uh, outcome that, that businesses have come to us trying to solve because you know it, it's no use creating benefits and well-being that doesn't benefit the well-being of their staff um, especially if they find that the uptake is is really low so finding something that actually gets people going and gets people engaged is definitely probably the most important thing um, that we've seen being um, be, being wanting to sort of discover by by businesses yeah getting the right information to the right people at the right time is 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 the secret really yeah and i think different different methods of deployment as well so so a lot of the time businesses that have um used sort of traditional touch points like email and uh, intranet systems and slack i think that often because we're so digitally saturated at the moment especially considering we're all working from home it can be quite difficult to get an initiative to kind of build up that uptake that we desire uh, because I think there's a bit of fatigue when it comes to stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of HR leaders might send an email to say that there's a, you know, a, some kind of well-being activity going on that they'd organise, but find that actually most people just they're, they're, they don't engage with that. So, finding ways to engage with people in a different way, I think, is something that that yeah, ought to be thought about. Yeah, I was on a I was on a mental health um, webinar this morning and a bunch of HR directors and they ran a poll to see what how, what, how many, what percentage of employees do people think were suffering from burnout symptoms before before COVID. And the poll came in at around 33%. There's a recent report that just came out yesterday saying that actually 67% of people were 
reporting burnout symptoms before COVID. So I, I hate to think what that's what that's going to be post COVID. Um, Lorena, Tamara, anything you guys want to jump in on, on that topic, on um, what you're seeing front of mind for employers? No. Uh, I think that that covers it. I think the, those are the top of mind things. I think increasingly. Um, employers feeling more of a role as part of an employee's support network overall. Um, and that's definitely because there's there's less of the separation, obviously, between um, work and life. Um, and so uh, the sort of employer's role and duty of care is just heightened by all this. Yeah, there's definitely been an enhanced personal connection, so talking to people in their homes, seeing the kids come and interrupt and the dogs barking and all the things that people you know, were maybe considered taboo and that have now become part of the sort of daily ritual almost. And, and I think has been for the most part quite a positive um, and and um, rewarding experience. So uh, I, I think, yeah, with that increased reach, if you like, um, all of these things are, are sort of flooding front and centre. I, I would add around... Uh, in a way, bringing additional enhanced clarity for HR experts and professionals to, to actually have a clear picture of what is going on with their employees, specifically them being remote. I think there is a dichotomy between a lot of articles coming and saying employees are a lot more productive being remote, while there is the other end of the spectrum of the different um, challenges that employees need to deal with working from home. So I think having a, a, a tool, having something that enables that uh, clarity and that measurability of what is actually happening with the employees in different geographies, in different regions, irrespective of whether they are at home or at work. That's what we've seen being a, a, a key, key area of demand, as well as having, uh, in a way, having everything in one picture, I think um, well-being has exploded over the past decade and there has been a wide range of solutions. And I think um, HR experts and professionals are, are now in need of seeing kind of everything in one place <laughs> rather than trying to combine data across different platforms and making sense of that to derive the right set of actions and initiatives internally. So I'd say measurability and really seeing the full picture. Right. Yeah, we're going to come on to um, data and um, I think a little bit and, um, and, and, and KPIs, which I think everyone is, um, is thinking about. The question, I'll start, I'll start with um, Tamara and then, and then Lorena, something I know you both, you both think a lot about. Um, so what, why, just taking, taking a quick step back, why do we really need to focus on that full spectrum of health and wellness? Um, that we've that we've started to paint a picture of. Um, have there been areas that people have neglected? Are there any you know Are there any areas that we should be focusing on more? How do how do we help create awareness of that full spectrum? Yeah, happy to start. So we've I mean we've mentioned duty of cares and it's the right thing to do. So I'm not going to to labour on that. I think more um, if you look at the impact of health and well being on an employee, um, there are the things that you can do to address it that are that are visible. So sort of ma almost maintaining the health and well-being of your workforce. And I think what we've found in talking to HR leads is that a lot of the current focus um, maybe has been on, on maintaining the status quo. How do you keep the levels of engagement that you currently have? How do you keep the levels of um, physical and mental well-being that maybe is, is what the baseline is? Um, but I think if you look beneath the surface, um, there's a couple of things going on. One is that um, the effects of, um, well, well, I think one is that the a, a large portion of the workforce is already living with um, some kind of condition. And um, that is something that I think we, we found nearly half, 46% of the workforce could be living with or caring for a loved one um, who is living with something non-acute. Now that can be anything from stress and anxiety to um, a, a more of a chronic uh, recurrent condition. Um, and that is something that is just, it's, it's a fact of having a diverse working population, a diverse uh, workforce or working age. Um, the second thing, which I think applies to all of us, is that the effects of um, those health conditions can really manifest itself in many ways that 
that means that the quality of day-to-day -day life um, and the productivity that you have when you're going through your working day is severely impeded or reduced. Um, and so there's really two things you can do about that. You can try and prevent um, these conditions happening in the first place. Um, and I know that's what some of us are focusing on. Um, and or you can focus on, given that a large portion of the of the workforce will have one of or more of these conditions, what do you do to provide the most support possible to help increase productivity, reduce absenteeism, um, and really mean that the, the kind of side effects and symptoms that can impact every day um, are, are as uh, reduced or as manageable as possible. And I'll just give a couple of examples, because I think what really brings it home for me is when we consider what these side effects and symptoms actually are. If you do have a condition that you're going through, and it can be anything um, from something that manifests physically, like, you know, itchy skin, or um, you can't, you're not as mobile as you as you usually are. Um, all the way through to brain fog. So, in, you know, imagine waking up in the morning and not being able to think that that second we all have before we realize that it's morning time and you're supposed to wake up. Imagine that kind of fogginess persisting through the day when you're trying to make decisions or you're trying to, um, you know, manage a team or being in a, in a discussion or something and you have that level of, of, of mental fogginess. So these are, these are side effects and symptoms that really affect day to day life. And so when we look at what is the kind of support needed and why, um, it's really, really wide ranging. Great, thanks. I think you're specifically talking about menopause side effects there, right? Well, the menop well that, I mean, the brain fog is something that definitely women go through the menopause are, are, are experiencing or a portion are experiencing, but, you know, brain fog comes from cancer treatment. Yeah. Um, stress and anxiety has all kind of mental, um, has all kind of mental acuity impacts and so yeah. on. So I think there's a lot of conditions that affect um, mental performance and physical agility and and all of that contributes to how well and how happy and how effective you are in your workday. Great. Uh, Lorena, do you, do you agree with that, that focus on the full spectrum and um, you know is that something that is that something that you think about and I, I guess back to the original question you know like why should we be focusing on um, health and wellness? <laughs> yes and I think that uh, completely the, the the full picture is is critical. I think historically in the if you like in the uh, early days of the last decade, uh, the focus has been 80, 90% on health and health screening and making sure that employees have health insurance and health packages. Then the focus has shifted more towards mental health over the past three, five years. And I think now due to COVID and also due to increased awareness, there is this kind of combination of understanding the importance of existing conditions as well as preventing uh, new ones linked to either mental health, emotional health, or or social um, connections. And actually, the research is starting to show that um, someone with obesity, diabetes has a higher risk of stress, anxiety, depression. Someone with cardiovascular conditions, whether it's hypertension or whether it's other uh, other manifested uh, conditions, they have a higher risk of musculoskeletal due to the uh, the blood flow in the body. So I think these two worlds are coming together in a much more cohesive way, number one. And number two, with the birth of... Um, insights into genetics, insights into a wide range of biomarkers, we have a much clearer picture of what is actually happening in the minds and in the bodies of employees on a, on a more continuous basis. And I think one of the most critical aspects in this space now is really ability to, to measure and see a baseline. You start now and it's, you know, new year, new you, you start in January, and you see that the baseline of the risk of stress, anxiety, depression is in 63% of your employees. And as you roll out certain initiatives or as you support people with their own companion apps, you see that that moves to 62.5 or 62%. And that 1% improvement, as in 1% decrease in that risk of stress, anxiety, depression, we have seen that that contributes by more than 20x as delivering a return on investment in terms of increased productivity and more focus in, in the employees on a day-to-day -day basis. We also see that um, decreasing uh, things like absenteeism and clearly presenteeism, which ties it back with what Tamara was talking about, that brain fog or that really not feeling at your best throughout the day is increasing the level of presenteeism, whether you're at home or at work. So I think that full picture 
is really the, the inception point of being able to help employees in a measurable way and on an ongoing basis. Can I just add one thing to that? I think, um, Narina, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, some of the examples you gave and why it, why it affects um, some of the metrics that are really important is crucial to this kind of discussion. Um, when you are living with those conditions, now it can really affect productivity and absenteeism because of the of what you're actually feeling and just not able to work. The other thing is um, not having access to the type of support that can actually help you at the time you need it. And so having to find it yourself, which is distracting and does take up a portion of the workday and whether you're doing that for yourself or a loved one. And I think that's the other point um, within this. There's for, for all of us at working of working age, you know, you've got people you're living with, parents, children, whoever, who are also going through um, health issues, well-being issues, and that does impact um, you as well. And I think that broader recognition of what's going on around you um, and how uh, distracting it can be, how much it can actually take up. Um, your concentration, your productivity, and so on is is important to recognize as well. Great. Uh, Andy, Ali, anything on that topic? Um, I would just add that I think another reason why it's important um, that we, you know, employers focus on this whole area is um, there's a stack of research that shows that trusted organizations like employers are actually uniquely placed to empower and encourage behavior change. So wherever you are on the spectrum, um, you know, and I know from my experience in this industry that if I go back 10, 15 years and we, we sat and spoke with an HRD about um, digital wellness, they, they sort of looked at you quizzically. And then over the sort of following years, wellness was seen as something that were, was well established, but more of a tick box exercise. And, and now we've sort of come through where I think it, it's sort of there for sort of genuine altruistic reasons. And, and concurrent to that, the employee attitude has, has equally shifted from nervousness and suspicion from an employer intervention program. You know, are they trying to find something out about me that they can use against me if there's a redundancy to really looking to that employer as a source of trust and truth to help them both look after themselves before they have a condition, but then deal better with that condition, however that's manifested itself. Yeah, great. Thank you, Andy. Ali, anything you want to add on that topic? Yeah, I suppose what I was thinking of just then was uh, trying to predict the future, which I'm sure none of us can do. But um, the question is, you know, how is our relationship with our employers going to change or how is the relationship between employees and employers going to change over the future? Because you could argue that perspectively going, you know, looking forward three years or four years, if we are all working remotely and maybe being a lot more independent, whether or not employers would feel the need to get involved to that level in terms of looking after their, their team and, and offering that kind of digital uh, wellness assistance. Um, but you could also transversely argue that it's going to be so important because of retention and engagement, especially if you're not physically in the same location, that companies will actually even, you know, embrace it even more um, to be able to kind of like look after their team, provide assistance where they can. So I think that you could definitely argue both sides that, you know, there is an argument that actually companies might be less interested because they, they view their workforce as more independent, uh, potentially kind of. Uh, have a more transient uh, workforce as well because of the, the global aspect of working remotely if, if that does become the trend. So, uh, you know, kind of food for thought. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that Andy mentioned um, behavioral change. The, 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 other, the other big topic, the other topic that's very much front of mind for HR directors at the moment is, um, is diversity. And um, that requires a lot of behavioral change. And we're seeing, we're seeing proof coming through that the more that you more that you have it stack and the more that you know you won't you won't address diversity by just doing unconscious bias training you have to roll out coaching and mentoring and, and give the whole set and the whole set of solutions to drive that behavioral change i think it's a little bit similar in, um, in health and wellness where you're trying to give optionality and give that full suite so that you know you can get employees can choose the right options and 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 back to Andy's point about nudging, employers can nudge employees along and, and help foster that behavioural change. I think it's a, a really interesting point. 
also I think the sort of the the potential death of the office might yeah. ch- might kind of spurn a new much stronger emphasis on providing these sorts of services because if you think about it a lot of companies have used their office as an environment to essentially influence how people feel you know there's a there's a really strong philosophy and thinking behind creating work environments that are you know well designed and if those are essentially done away with or less commonplace i think companies are going to still struggle to find a way to kind of imbue some kind of sense of happiness, wellness, togetherness, remotely. Um, you know, I, I know that sometimes I've been in certain offices that make me feel collaborative. They, they kind of are very conducive to, to productivity. They're very conducive to feeling, you know, happy. And, and you know, if it's a nice office with, with, well, with lots of good lighting and good plants, you feel, you feel good about being there. And yeah. obviously that's done away with. So I wonder if companies will think, well, there's gotta be a way that we can cultivate that sense without yeah. a physical location. If I, uh, let, let, let's, let's stick on that topic because we had a question from Three about that. Would, um, the question is around the, the best practices in terms of facilitating that health and wellness at home. So are there, are there things that you've seen other companies do or things that you're doing yourself? What, um, what, what, what do you guys think is, um, is really making an impact in this new distributed way of working where um, you know, we're trying to help people at home? Anyone jump in? Happy to have a go. A couple, a couple of things that both worked for me and I know worked in different continents and different geographies. I think in this combined world, people uh, usually struggle to, to, to clearly delineate what is work time and what is personal time. And I think really finding uh, where you want to draw the line, both physically as in having a space that is your workspace, as well as emotionally and psychologically that you have a a, a safety line that you draw and say, okay, from here on is family time, from here on is me time, I think is, is critical. And another aspect is to find ways and I've seen that both from our team as well as from um, partners and clients we have, finding a way to still connect with your team and whether you do an offsite, uh, we've done so a few weeks ago and worked very well to still connect physically with, with the people that you're working closest to because that builds or rebuilds that trust and that openness to be able to build on the, the virtual, <laughs> the digital version of the relationship. So still having those moments interspersed, even if they are once every two months. Great. Yeah, it's interesting. I, one of the trends that I've seen is the, um, I think it started one-to-ones between line managers and, and direct reports started because everyone was panicking and checking in on everyone, you know, to make sure that they were okay. Uh, at, at the peak and, and that's actually continued and it's become a new behavior where you know people are now talking to each other every day and, and it's bringing in that cadence to performance management and productivity as well as a you know a, men, a, a mental health are you okay check-in so it's having that it's, i think it's having that byproduct as well but any any anyone anyone seen any other changes yeah, well, or, well uh, just a, just just an observation really keith uh, for, as a discussion point i don't know yeah. I, I think um, I'm not so convinced that the the way that we used to work is is, is completely dead forever. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I have a fit. You know, right now it feels like no one's ever going to be going back and working collaboratively, and I and I think there will be some very positive changes in that people aren't just unnecessarily schlepped backwards and forwards for prefix times on mass. But yeah. but there is a loss. I, I think there's a real loss, a cultural loss. A, a personal loss in the that, that that comes as a result of working remotely. The advantages of working remotely are when that's part of an overall flexible approach to your job. Um, and I and I just have a feeling that that things may may revert closer back to how they were pre COVID than, than than maybe is the sort of per- pervasive feeling um at the moment and, and 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 that can be a good thing or a bad thing or you, are you i think that's a good thing i i think it's i think it's really i think it's really important and i even read something yesterday where they were talking about this sort of delineation between your sort of you know your working life th- th- and your personal life i know that there was plenty of times when i traveled into london and it was a bit frustrating because my meeting had overrun and then i was stuck in rush hour but actually that process allowed me to 
work through what it was that had been going on in my head and in my day. And by the time I got home and walked through the door, I was ready to to engage really well with the family at home. Um, sometimes if you've had a, you know, a difficult call or a difficult decision or an anxiety or a problem and you shut your spare room door and walk straight out into the hall because <laughs> you've finished work and it, it doesn't it doesn't go so well. I mean, maybe that says more about me than the situation. Um, but I, I seem to manage to get myself into more trouble um, than I used to when I was when I had that process of um, of, you know, yeah, a, a sort of cathartic way of processing, yeah, yeah. processing the day. And but what you don't want to do is have to go in and out every day just because that's what the sort of routine is. It's, it's, it's about having that blend and that that ability to work remotely when it's the right thing to do and but not completely lose that that connection and that that sense of a central place where you can sort of come together and and there's all sorts of things that, that you know you can spark off each other when you're when you're in the same physical location that you can't quite do in the same way when you're having a digital conversation in, in yeah. view. and the thing that I read was that they were talking sorry there was a point to that ramble sorry Keith <laughs> was that you know, someone was talking about is a fake commute the way to yeah. make sure you have balance in your life you know like actually recreate that process where you say you know, maybe not travel in and out to London, but, <laughs> but go, go through some yeah. form of journey. And, yeah. and the other thing it overlooks is, you know, I, I would assume that we're all probably quite fortunate in that we have the physical environment at home, that we're able to have a degree of segregation and nicely set up um, with, a, with a dedicated space that's got everything we need to work efficiently and calmly and quietly. Lots of people don't have that. You know, lots of people are working on their kitchen table. And for them, I'm not so sure that being told that's how you're going to work forever is a positive or motivating thing. I, I, yeah, I would yeah. think quite the opposite. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I am. I, um, sorry, go ahead, Tamar. No, I'm just going to bring, bring it to the to how this um, how this lends to the kind of support that employers need to provide, because I think that the, um, the at home model to the to the points we made earlier means that there is this blended um, sense of what you what you as an employee is is, is a refl reflective of what's going on in the home as, as such and I think that's why maybe some of the health and well-being support is really now breaking down the different stages that you might be going through as a person as a as an employee but just as a person as a family member and so on so if you're if you I think that manifests itself in two different ways one is looking at the different stages of life and what you might be going through the other is where well-being may be impacted so on that first you know if you are going through life in, in a and I don't want this to be cliche but you know there are there are stages that you go through in terms of say fertility or in terms of menopause or in terms of um you know building a home building a family what that whatever that might be what is the kind of well-being support that an employer can provide so that you can um, do that to the best of your ability and be as productive as an employee as possible during that and feel cared for and supported. The other is when well-being is impacted and if that's because you're remote or you don't have a good place to work or or there's a lot going on or you physically have a condition um, then it's again it's I think it's increasingly important for employers to be more specific in what is the type of support that they're providing. So rather than sort of general um physically you know, andy you mentioned earlier step counting you know eat better people know that now let's break it down into what's actually going on with someone and in, in in their home and meaning that they can't give their full self um at home or at work and support that so whether it is stress or whether it is the menopause or whether it is that your parent has dementia um figuring out what's the focused support that that can um that that what and what that looks like and Keith you asked an earlier question about um what actually works nowadays and what's the kind of um support that's actually useful what we've seen working I think it's when people are equipped with the tools and information and peer support or expert support to actually figure that out for themselves and and feel empowered to be able to um do the best they can for whatever state their well-being is in so whether that means being able to read the right stuff, whether that means being able to have the right analysis. Lorena talks about biomarker analysis as well to figure out, you know, how you want to improve your health and well-being, or whether it is finding others going through the same, whether it's financial well-being or whether it is, um, you know, mental well-being or whatever, finding others in the same boat who you can talk to or someone trusted that you can refer to and find the right kind of ex expertise. I think those are the really practical things that mean you feel more empowered as an employee to take control of 
of your health and well-being and make it the best you can within whatever limitations there are at the moment. Great, great. I'm gonna. I'm I can gonna just. Move. Sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry, it wasn't move on. I was just gonna mention that. Um, yeah. You know, worst case scenario, and I hope my uh, doomsday prediction is is right. That worst case scenario, we're going to be dealing with this for the next two years. So, you know, March will be a year. Um, we all hope that we can go back to some kind of normalcy before two years, but two years is, even if it would be, you know, torturous to go through two years of this, it's still really nothing in the grand scheme of things. It's a blip. Um, it's a tiny, tiny, short period of time to be going through. And I, and I know that we're going to learn a lot, but I just, you know, to make sort of, I think, because we're in it, like, um, like, like has been mentioned, because we're in it right now, we feel like the world is going to change forever. But I think that because we'll adapt, when, when we start, you know, we are social people, we're social animals, we want to be with each other. The reason why we had offices in the first place is because of that. So I think uh, there will definitely, you know, it, it would be foolish to think that you know, the world has completely permanently changed. I think that once once things are back to normal, we'll, we'll probably want to come back to offices. Um, but I think the problem is that if everyone could click their fingers and be in an office and remove the commute, I think most people would go for that. Um, because as you mentioned, we are fortunate to have nice environments, but a lot of people don't have that luxury. So I think the commute is the part that people dread, but actually being in a work environment with others is probably not something that people don't miss. I mean, I, I, would, I mean I'm in an office right now, but I, I would like to have my team back um, personally. Yeah. But do you think if we go back to the office environment, that there'd be good things that will come out of this period um, from, if you think of the kind of, um, uh, uh, I was going to say whatever the the, the verb of um, catalyzes. So the whole type of uh, catalyst, uh, everything that has um, been um, was, was sort of bubbling away in terms of health and well-being support has come to the surface because of the last few months. And people and employers and HR directors are making p changes that aren't going to go away, even if it, things resume to partially normal. So even if we're back in an office, there's still going to be that enduring new level of support for mental well-being, for physical well-being, for recognising um, more of the specifics of what people are going through. And these are programmes that hopefully, may never be too optimistic, but I hope these are not just for the interim. I think these are things that th this is, catalyze the realization of what actually holistic workplace support looks like yeah. um, and that's something that hopefully won't go away just if the model of working becomes more hybrid or goes back to office based or whatever it is I think this might be a permanent change in the way that employers are supporting employees that we never saw before um, yeah. at least some good comes from this period then one of final thoughts from my side and I think you know there's a lot of thinking hats, thinking of how to support employees in these times. And what we've seen actually incredibly effective in the last six months has been actually asking employees, giving them a voice, them through these uh, companion apps, through these tools that we've all built, giving them a, a way to express what they need, what they want, what is actually happening with them at that point in time, because they are going through a massive inflection point. And for us being in a decision-making uh, position it is much clearer and maybe simpler, but for employees to really, for them to have a, a voice to bring to the surface these topics in a, in a non-structured way, I think is gonna be vital for this, whether Ali is right for two years or whether it's gonna be <laughs> a new normal TBD, but for employees to really have a voice such that they feel that what they, share and what they've contributed that they want to see happening is exactly what is happening yeah i think i think i think you're spot on i think it's about having a voice and again to parallel that to diversity you know we're, we're seeing generally in the world that you know we have to be better at really hearing what you know root causes and deep issues are with employees and we we i don't think the, i think the hr profession has taken their eye off the ball i am um, I spoke to a CEO yesterday who quote unquote said, I am a big fan of the pandemic because he sees it as driving behavioral change that we've needed for a lot, that we've needed for and accelerating that behavioral change that someone mentioned earlier that we've needed for a long time. He also said, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be building these environments. I'm starting to see my employees be more productive because they can have the agency choose where they work. Um, 
So I think it's about giving them, giving them, um, giving them choice, but also giving them agency to work wherever they can be most productive. Um, and his question on the back of that was, why wasn't HR thinking about this ten years ago? So I thought that was a very, um, that was a very, a very valid question. But at least now we're seeing that that accelerate. I hope that stuff. Personally, I hope that stuff changes. Third, third. Uh, sorry, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, Keith. I think most people that are involved in sort of small organisations, startups, and SMEs, I, I, I bet everybody on this call would say that they've these some of these working practices that are being hailed as new yeah, and innovative. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was how we worked anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that that was nothing has changed really, and other than that we, we can't now get together. Ninety nine percent of your employees are high agency and highly motivated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. In, in a ten thousand person organization, you exactly. Have, so yeah, yeah. You Very going, difficult. You have people yeah. going to work and work and attending meetings for the sake of attending meetings and yeah. scrolling up and scrolling down. So I think it's I think what we're doing now is we're unearthing that. Yeah, and, and we're and, and we're going to become much more outcome focused. I come yeah. focus is the third topic. Do you like how I did that? Yeah. Uh, um, so, so what, what, just for everyone really, what, what outcomes should we be focused on? So what, um, what outcomes do you guys talk to clients about? Um, what KPIs are HR directors really focused on that you're, that, that you're impacting and that you're seeing front of mind? We've talked a little bit about it, but let's, let's go a little bit deeper. I'm happy to start. I've got two two sort of quantitative ones and one one qualitative softer one. Um, I think we've mentioned it, but productivity, absenteeism. Um, if you can, and and ultimately that leads to ROI. So you know we all have products and tools that um that uh, uh, workforces can, employers can use. Um, we can prove that there's a return on any investment they make in a support platform because product there's days gained um and fewer days lost. And I think if you know if you feel feel better you can self-manage you're more empowered you're not distracted and so on that's the clearest sign in from a business case point of view um that this is a tool or, or something that's worth using and rolling out um and i think that's something you know ultimately there's the there's the there's this two-pronged um uh, case to make one is the duty of care one of the right thing to do this is what people are going through we need to be more focused um covid has heightened all of that you know we have to be providing more of this whole employee support the other is why this needs signing off at some level in an organization um it needs uh some it needs budget from somewhere it needs to be part of um a an overall business plan that doesn't just focus on business performance but looks at employee well-being and, um, as part of that performance and that's where the metrics like productivity absenteeism efficiency gains and so on um may seem fairly dry when you're talking about people and their health but actually those are the things that help make the case the softer one is more around i think we were just touching on the agency that employees um feel they have but if it becomes more normal in your workforce to be open if you have stress or anxiety or you've had a miscarriage or you're going through the menopause or your parent or loved one um, has cancer or dementia or something like that that is a metric that people are being more um, engaged with their health but also more open and vocal about it and that in turn leads to more sharing more empowerment more self-management tips all of that kind of thing so I think there's something about the degree of um, employee engagement with their own health and well-being um, the openness about it and, um, and the desire to improve their day-to-day -day quality of life um, that maybe you know was just a kind of the focus on your own health um, was a bit to the side uh, before and now it's it's forefront because we're, we're hearing more about it employers are doing more about it etc so I, I and the first two are easier to measure that third one um is some kind of sentiment analysis um so yeah that's all I have to say but I'm, I'm gonna just put Lorraine on the spot I'd be really curious to hear um when you answer Keith's question about how you've seen particularly around sort of self-analysis if people are becoming more engaged and if that's an interesting outcome um given the tool you have but anyway I will yeah, go ahead. Questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Keith and Tamara. Spot on. So, what? Um, first of all, a, a, a bit of context. I think uh, uh, Keith, as you mentioned, that you know, why did HR professionals didn't do this ten years, uh, ten years ago? And I think I've been privileged enough to to speak to tens and hundreds. And actually, it's a it's a very challenging spot that HR professionals find themselves in. I think the historical um, 
a role of doing dealing uh, with a lot of the admin and then having to deal with health, wellness, well-being, which was a new topic, completely not trained in. And now they are in the spotlight with everything that happens with employees because of COVID. So I see uh, one of the key themes that we also recognize besides measurement and besides being able to provide that, that tangible ROI is really empowering HR professionals with that tool set such that it's self-evident what is actually happening with their employees. So uh, we talk about the technological revolution and actually it's time to apply that revolution to a tool that HR professionals can just leverage and see, okay, I started here three months ago, this is what's going on. These are the things that I've done in the meantime and this is what I'm doing now. And from there to derive insights as to decreased um, Burnout, burnout is the key theme that we've seen is, is a question mark. Burnout levels have gone out uh, up as Keith mentioned <laughs> earlier. Also in terms of um, energy levels. So a way to measure whether we call it productivity, whether we call it energy, whether we call it life quality for an employee, a way to measure that and see how that fluctuates both over time, but even more importantly, even within a week, so we've seen through COVID times kind of slumps specifically in middle of the week, and then it starts to go up a little bit and then goes down uh, towards Friday. And then throughout COVID, we've seen things like um, uh, financial well-being literally plummeting and now slowly starting to go up again across different organizations and aspects like environment. I think companies have worked a lot on culture historically and culture has been a big topic. Now that whole environment culture topic has shifted at the micro level within the home of the employee. So what are, how, what is a way to measure that and how can an employer support with that or how can they empower employees to deal with that? And then of course, it all comes together with that clear journey of, you know, these are the initiatives that I've rolled out. This has been the impact on the employees this has been the voice of the employee. This is what they've said works, doesn't work. Even beyond the high level engagement numbers, more a, a qualitative evaluation. And then this is kind of a continuous um, learning loop. I started here, I've done this, it worked, this didn't work. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do again. This is what I'm not gonna do again. So kind of that, that journey, support with that journey is what I've seen is, is the key demand now. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. I'm, I'm just mindful of time. The, the main, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue on this topic if, if Ali and Andy would like to, would like to address the outcomes question. Um, but, but the thing that I'll throw in, we've had a couple. I think we've addressed most of the questions, but the, the, the other question is, is actually the topic that we discussed yesterday on our pre call around, um, around ROI and showing the financial director. I think you know the, the dichotomy between the increased focus on this topic and getting the outcomes and the you know, the smaller budgets that we're all now managing. So if you guys can maybe weave that into your answer as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, we know from our from our experience at Road to Health, our sort of proposition is born out of um, a product that was originally delivered into the insurance industry. And therefore the data and the analysis of that data was absolutely fundamental. And not only the data itself, but the clinical validation behind that data was, you know, because in that market space, it's all about accurately being able to predict the risk associated with ill health. So, so like most businesses that are offering some sort of wellness and engagement solution, we we you know we we have a whole range of metrics that can you can then argue demonstrates ROI downstream, um, and we have um, yeah you know validation behind those metrics. But what I found as a slight difference in the employer space is that there is an equal level of interest. Um, centered on the engagement piece where a big part of the solutions we often bring is not only our product in and of itself, but also the fact that our product can become a single digital access point through to existing services. Um, and, you know, work with large international corporates in the past, they've been as motivated by being able to demonstrate utilization of things that were already there, but perhaps weren't that accessible um, and, and drawing on some of um, Tamara's points earlier, being able to evidence the specificity and relevance of the intervention at the right time for the right thing. So diving that little bit deeper, because, because you create a joined up journey, 
that's able to accurately identify the things that people are going through and signpost them through to the right kind of um, enhanced service, that, that's quite a key metric for employers as well. Because in my experience, most of them are actually already spending a lot of time and money on a lot of things designed to improve the health and well-being of their workforce. Um, and it's just being able to make sure that's directed to the right people at the right time in the right way. And that's an important metric as well. Great. Ali? Yeah, if I just jump in here. So I think that one of the challenges that we've had is really trying to sort of communicate tangible benefits. I think it, uh, in our prequel, we spoke about um, you, you're, you're promising an outcome tomorrow rather than immediately. And I think what's resonated a lot with HRDs and managing directors for us is that the fact of the matter is that we have a marketplace that any kind of member, any kind of employee with any kind of life uh, circumstance can access and use immediately. And obviously for us, you know, if, if you take the example of a sales software, for example, a lot of um, finance directors will look at a sales software and think, well, if we can make one sale, it will pay for itself. And I think that we try and put those in, in those terms, which is that if, if you can keep one of your staff members uh, engaged, retained and happy, it kind of pays for itself. So that's how we, we kind of use those, those kinds of outcomes you know, over, over the course of a year. Let's track your engagement. Let's track your retention. Let's track how people are sort of answering your uh, culture questionnaires. And then we can sort of start saying that the, the usage of Juno and the usage of, of support um, that they get from that has directly impacted those those sort of uh, those metrics. Okay, interesting. Um, interesting questions just come through. I think we've got time to cover it, and then I'll I'll, I'll sum I'll sum up. Other than your own product, what is the most interesting? Um, solution in the marketplace that you think is really helping drive health and wellness can uh, we all just say each other's well <laughs> yeah okay yeah i want to then just go going clockwise there um so okay andy you've spoken first so you can start what everyone else thinks <laughs> um, well I, I i mean i i i do think i, I can only, I'll, I'll talk about you know we we work in partnership with um live better with um a sort of technology partner into them and and I, I, I do think from a sort of condition management point of view, um, it is absolutely excellent what they're, what they're doing. Um, you know, our experience is in trying to work with organisations to help prevent ill health coming by changing lifestyle behaviours today. And it's therefore, it's aimed at the masses. It's, it has, by definition, a degree of generalism in its approach because it's about simple behaviors but we are able to drill down to individual risk factors and assess the likelihood but at the point that um someone is accurately identified as needing real help that's when the sort of level of support needs to ramp up and deepen sufficiently um and i do think that um one thing the wellness industry is getting better at is understanding that no one provider can do everything and nor should they try and do everything um, yeah. and so we increasingly in every implementation we do working with a big insurer or a sort of international um, reinsurer or or corporates or you know or even smes often the secret is in creating a sort of joined up ecosystem approach yeah, okay um, yeah okay cool live better with but lots of others as well yeah answer, right the, the rain out one sentence answer <laughs> I don't, I, I, the non-answer <laughs> that I will give. I think there is um, uh, certain organizations, depending on where they are in their life cycle, they might benefit more or less from, sort of, from, from all of our solutions. I think the one keen companion to, to health and well-being is communication. So I think really having the right approach such that employees, whether within the organizations and outside of the organization, can connect. I think that is the, the right companion tool to yeah. any. Great. Great. Different, but great answer. <laughs> Ali? Uh, it's a tough one. I think um, I was, I was going to say I was going to say some kind of uh, connectivity, so community connectivity tool. Yeah. Um, I mean, Slack is obviously not used for well-being and health, but 
a way that can, especially in a time like this, something that can connect people across maybe even genuine continents, you know, people together um, is something that, I mean, is, is going to definitely help. Okay. Great. Thank you. Tomorrow. Aside from everybody's tools, and I love all of the replies. So <laughs> I, saw, um, I saw Public Health England is actually looking at how to support employers. And that's a real shift in the last few months, I think, realising um, the kind of health and wellbeing support that's needed um, sort of as a country and the way to do that being um, through the workforce. I think that's really, really exciting. It means we can make differences on a national scale. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, just a couple of points I want to I want to pull out um, that I that I picked up as we uh, as we've gone along. I think number one, um, I'm hearing about the really focusing on supporting employees in this new distributed way of working, and um, that that requires number two a full a full end to end suite that covers the full spectrum of what we're looking at across prevention and existing conditions, um, and and that that is really number three about driving behavioural change. Um, and, and getting that feedback loop of um, measurement and um, learning what's really working. And um, Lorena's point about um, you know tw tweaking what, what works and what doesn't work. So um, I think it's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, we've had we've had good engagement. And uh, thank you, thank thank you firstly to everyone who joined. Um, and thanks for sending to thanks for sending through the questions. Um, I think we should probably set up a, a, a follow up. Um, and thank you so much to. Um, to um, all of the panelists. It's been um, great to have your expertise and, um, and have what I think has become a a, a emerged into a really interesting conversation for everyone. Thanks very Thank much. You so Thank much. you very much. Thanks, Thanks for your time, you. everyone. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Have a good Cheers. day. Bye. 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 Bye.